We should be live. Hello. Good afternoon at this extraordinary time of the day. We are here with another Multimusic Technology Chat. Today I have a special guest. Oh, I almost got it right first time. It's uh, Mr. Mylan Melodies over here on my left. Could be, could be right. I'm not entirely that, sure. Yeah, you're there. Should we shake hands? Oh, yeah. Hello, mate. <laughs> Hi. Just there. Just there. <laughs> I, can, I want to be near you. I need to be near a person. I'm very lonely here in yes. this age of COVID-19. Do let us know in the chat if you can hear both of us and see both of us. That would be super. And then we will, we will crack straight on with our our um, our chat this Debate. afternoon. Debate? Yes. Debates. That's what we like. Argu I'm here for an argument. I'm going to be argumentative, controversial. Mm. I think there's plenty of that to go around. I don't think there'll be any chance of uh, bypassing any of that. All good, says Paul. Thank you. Hear and see. Check. Good. Thank you, Christopher. It's good of you to say. That's much appreciated. Right. Well, in that case, um, with no further ado, we are here for a, a chat, a discussion, an open forum, if you like. So you're very welcome to contribute in the chat about synthesizers soft and hard. <laughs> Oh. Software synthesizers, hardware synthesizers, the pros, the cons, the fors, the against, the whys and wherefores, uh, and that kind of thing. That's a general idea. That's what we're going to try to, to track down today. And uh, I've invited, or rather, I did invite, I think, or maybe he invited himself. I'm trying to remember how the conversation went so now. I think. You were like, I need someone to talk about this with, and I'm like, you could talk to me about it. <laughs> and I said, no, 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 go on. You must know someone I can talk to. I think that's yeah, exactly. it. <laughs> well, there is someone. So, uh, yeah, so we decided to get together to talk about um, uh, software and hardware since because this is Computer Music Week from, from my own personal festival of computer music I'm having this week. Don't know how many other people have, have enjoyed that, but I have, certainly. And so software synthesizers are certainly a thing, and it would be interesting just to, to roll that conversation around to see, see where that gets us. But maybe before we kick off, there might be people out there who don't know you, so... So maybe you can give us your, your the two minute tour of your who the of heck my, you are. Yeah, okay. Um, so my name is Alex, uh, but I'm known on the internet as Mylar Melodies. That means uh, Mylar Melodies is a person who makes synth demo videos. I'm like a sort of one person kind of advert for what's great about synthesizers or particular bits of kit. You know, I don't do reviews. I'm not here to sort of give you the, the balanced view in that sense, because all the things that we have to mess around with are just, I don't sort of make videos about sort of bad things, if that makes sense. It's mm. an interesting. So, um, and I make generally videos about um, hardware, which is interesting. And most people know me for making kind of modular videos so messing around with modules, particularly showing how a particular module works or what's good about it. Um, but also I do do videos about um, like hardware synths. And my day job is that I work for the distributor in the UK. So I, for uh, Arturia and Moog and other brands as well. Uh, and today there's a particularly kind of Arturian sort of um, <laughs> discussion to have because Arturia being a company that originally made software recreations of hardware synthesizers that were you know certainly at the time unavailable or, you know were mm. vintage pieces and just not you know weren't available um, of course some of these things are actually back in production now which is just amazing um but then you know they're a company who also then made um controllers for the software and then made hardware since themselves so it's they are a really good example of a company that cross that sort of hardware software divide mm. and there's this kind of classic debate which is that in you know do soft synths sound like the thing that they are meant to be a recreation of exactly and that's a whole debate you know are they exactly the same and then there is the, also the question of does it matter you know does is, a sol is it better to work with a computer and just write music more quickly and use the computer as a kind of sound module and just very quickly get your sound? Because what I would say, and not as a person just who works with these companies, but as a musician myself, this is my studio, these are all like things that I have. Um, you know, I 
I do this myself and I've made electronic music for over 20 years. So I, I eat my own dog food when it comes to talking about this stuff. So I've got all <laughs> the Arturia stuff. I've got all of the V Collection 8. You know, obviously I've got all of that software and not just the Arturia stuff. I use software from lots and lots and lots of different companies. So like as another good example, like Urs Heckman, Yuhi, the Diva, mm -hmm. Repro. I've just been playing with those recently. Those are amazing. And I think there is on many levels there is stuff to kind of talk about. There are benefits uh, to both ways of working, uh, which we can talk about. So, but, uh, you know, personally speaking, right out the gate, uh, I eat both cans of dog food. I love hardware stuff. I like exclusively hardware stuff. And a lot of the time, interestingly, I will tend to use software mutually exclusively as well. I tend not to like... Mm -hmm. I find it really, I tend not to blend the two, interestingly. So you see all this hardware stuff. Currently, like I am planning in my own studio the way I want to do it. I have got a really posh hardware sequencer and that hardware sequencer I want to try and keep exclusively for sequencing hardware. And I make music in the computer and I just do that when I'm looking at that computer monitor. I just stare at that monitor and I tend not to use the hardware. Do you know what I mean? I it's, do. I know exactly what you mean. I just zone in on it and I'm mm. like in Ableton Live and I'm drawing on soft synths and I'm drawing on samples that I have and I like working really, I can work quickly doing that because I can quickly pull up sounds and actually in an Archerian sort of point, the analog lab, which is analog lab is not what if you bought v collection 8 which is their sort of software instrument that gives you all of their instruments uh sorry v collection uh yeah, yeah we're v gonna Co we're gonna we're gonna bypass the fact that you said v collection 8 and we're gonna ignore that that happened and we're going to move on under the knowledge that the current version is version 7 of course oh, yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> but, sorry, sorry. But no, yeah yes but no doubt those things those things do uh do get upgraded over time we won't do i certainly there. hope so i yeah. won't i won't more things please so do, I mean, do you are you seeing you these two the, things as separate worlds is that yeah well yeah. and what i was going to say is that with the v collection if which when you get v collection it is not the most exciting thing maybe on paper that you get analog lab which is the name mm. of the um analog lab is like the um it's the sort of librarian basically which you use and it draws all of the presets from the various instruments that are in it but what i wanted to sort of say is like i've made a lot of music with just analog lab because it allows you to quickly sort of find sounds draw them out and then just write quickly um and to me that sort of it's like you've got all of this stuff but there's this thing <laughs> seems like having loads of hardware would just be a wonderful thing and i must honestly say that like i personally i'm i was more productive when i had less stuff unquestionably mm. because i can focus i can focus on it you know and it's so if you've got just like one thing i find i can be a lot more creative because i'm sort of i work harder with that one thing versus you know that's the only problem with the computer there's so many options there's so many things that i can do it's it's really tricky and so for me the benefit of that's like messing with v collection and messing with analog lab is a way that i can just draw sounds out quickly and write and then worry about sound design as a separate process because that's kind of always that you know saying which is true is that no matter how good your sounds are you've got to have a good song do you know what i mean i mean i know yeah. that's bleeding obvious, but easy to forget when you're like dead excited about some new synth that you've got and it's mm. um yeah so it it is like um i don't know i i think it's so tempting to say that you should have a room full of hardware and i say that as a person in a room full of hardware but it's only because i've got like a real fetish for hardware since we can talk about the benefits of you know what is good about hardware since um because there is a lot to say about that but if you if your goal is to write quickly i think you can i think if you're disciplined you should be able to you can do everything in a computer and, and it sounds amazing like mm. soft synths sound amazing they do 
There's no, no one can argue this anymore. And very analog, I would say. Mm. I'll stop talking. <laughs> That's all right. We like to hear you talk. Mm. Sit here and hear you talk. Thanks, but Frank. I mean, what I think what's what's interesting in in some ways is that uh, many of us have spilled out of the box. Many of us have, have been inside the computer for yeah, for a decade, maybe writing music in software, being completely happy with that. And then recently, that's certainly been my journey of rediscovering hardware and then spilling all out of it again. And in some ways, we're going to be going in cycles because we that what's exciting about hardware initially is that, yeah, you've only got one or two bits and you focus on those. And that's that feels different and new because you've been going through preset after preset on your computer, just constant more and more since plug another one in, buy another plug in, off you go. Uh, whereas in hardware, you tend to start small and that's very illuminating, I think. And you get massively creative very fast. But then your hardware starts to grow and you find yourself, I've got too many modules. I can't, you know, I can't, I'm overwhelmed now with the amount of hardware that I have and this and that. And then how do I plug all that together? And it suddenly throws itself up as being more complex than perhaps you thought. And those initial, that initial honeymoon period of embracing hardware, um, perhaps starts to show itself with the complexity that it is. And software, you know, actually finding presets is a, is a different thing. But maybe we're talking about two different things. Maybe there's, a, there's an experience of synthesizers, which is one for the love of sound. And there's an experience of synthesizers for, for using in work, in getting a job done. You know, you're not always, it's like, I mean, it's a, a software synthesizer like um, uh, Spectrosonics, uh, atmosphere or is that the old Omnis one omnisphere thank you yeah omnisphere it's so huge that you can't use it in anything because you just play a patch and it's <sighs> and say well that's great but i just want something to fit in amongst the drums and the bass and the other bit over here and so you actually want thinner more adaptable sounds and something like that but the love of playing with that instrument as an instrument is a is a whole other thing mm. it's there's a question about sort of yeah, it can be addictive, but both software and hardware can be addictive buying, you know, it's a buying process. And I think then you run the risk of being more addicted to buying things than making music with it, you know. And of course, yeah. it's in my job to get people excited about new bits of kit. You know, that's every piece of kit has got something really exciting about it. And there's a reason it exists and it should be considered and I, it's it's sort of a joy and a curse of my job that I have to you know I'm always considering new things I'm like hey what would I do with this and that is always exciting because I'm always looking for uh, the easier way to make music and I don't necessarily mean in kind of a lazy sense but just mm. I'm not at this point 20 years in I'm not about shortcuts I haven't taken a sort of shortcut route to, to kind of anything particularly I've done it long enough so I've put the time in but it I don't know. It is tempting to think that one extra thing will be just enough to make some music. And uh, there's so much good stuff for so little money these days, you know. And mm. it's uh, you know, starting with Mini Brute back in the day. It's the way, you know, there have been crazy deals. I mean, they've always been sort of affordable since, but it feels now more than ever. There's uh, plugins that are 25 quid or free, you know, amazing mm -hmm. free plugins as well. It sound really analog and fascinating as well as hardware that's that's cheap and i think it's just it but i it does require a discipline both with hardware and software to sort of i find it compartmentalizing processes so as i was mentioning earlier you know like the collection thing it's it's the if you've if you compartmentalize the writing process then it's a very i find it's a very responsible way to make music personally speaking and it's kind of I'm for me it's what's really good about the computer it's the fact that I've got this you know interface where I can just go I just want like a you know, dark base and I get a dark base and I just get on with it mm -hmm. I can always redo that on the synths later though honestly I tend not to I'm like this sounds really good this is fine let's have this and then um you know same with hardware it's if you if you've really chosen your gear well I find it's I like doing live jams. I like having like three or four things. I've just been doing some videos with like two things, like a drum machine and just a hardware synth. And if you can focus on that without worrying about what you don't own, then you can just have so much fun. Um, and it's then what I would do is 
do big live jams, record them into the computer, and then chop them up and use the computer as a sort of tape machine. Although I have done the whole thing of when I've been like messing around, I remember I had the IntelliJ Shapeshifter module and I was like, just had a really cool chord sound on that once. I was like, this is great. I'm like, record it quick before it disappears. And then that little loop, I built a whole track out of and uh, multiple mm. tracks. In fact, you know, and I, it began with just a modular loop. I then turned the modular off. That's all it contributed, which was very little, but it was the spark of the idea that I then finished off. And I actually used like lots of other you know, plugins, you know, UAD plugins, Arturia plugins, other people's plugins, and it becomes a whole computer arrangement. But the hardware, the hardware contributed technically very little to the tune, but it was the most important initial spark. Mm. And that, hence that's, that's kind of me again, compartmentalizing. It's like once I've had that initial spark in the piece of hardware, I then, the computer's just the perfect finishing tool. Mm. Um, but then the other thing is, there's certain styles of music, I'm gonna name drop here. I was talking to Surgeon who is a very famous techno artist because my next episode of my podcast will have Surgeon on, uh, which should be out this weekend, I hope. Um, nice. And yeah, thank you. Well, he is, I'm very, very lucky to be able to speak to someone like that. And I asked him this question because it, to me, I am always amazed that people can write dance music in a linear DAW arranger because I find, whilst obviously dance music is very much like things happen in, bars of four and eight and you know that's a very it, it could be argued as being very simplistic music because so much of it is based on feel then mm. i find i find that that kind of arrangement is so much easier to do as a live jam where you've got just like mutes on and off mm. and you can physically interact and you, you just basically have all the loops that make your song play and then use the mixer to fade things in and out and create the jam. To me, for that style of music, using a hardware mixer and working in the hardware world feels like the, the most natural and organic way to do it because you can react intuitively, like, oh, now it feels like something needs to happen. You can just make it happen. Whereas on when you know with your mouse, you're like sort of trying to anticipate oh it'll probably you can play it back but it's you lose that sort of sense of immediacy i think I you're have... trying to uh to formulate some form of perfection though i think that the the door gives us the opportunity to massage things to such a degree that we can get it you can get the drop to happen exactly on that point that you want it to happen you can do it by design and i think perhaps that that's the attraction to uh to working in in computers is that you can get it exactly right i mean i, mm. I know i've i have at times trying to to write something which then i want to extract the groove from a guitar part for instance to try to use that to everything else and i'll work on that for a couple of days and then by the third day i would have just pulled it all apart and squashed it back to the grid again because it just feels too unwieldy somehow and, but that's because the computer, I think, is offering me the opportunity to do that. Um, whereas, and I think that's that's very attractive, particularly in dance music, which can be formulaic. And that's okay. Everything is formulaic. Obviously, you know, you're trying to find a formula which works. And often the, the perfection and the timing of that within a within a door you know, really feeds into that idea. But I totally get what, what you're saying. I mean, you know, back, at the, back in the early days of dance music with Underworld or Orbital playing at... Uh, Glastonbury and stuff you know they weren't really creating any sound but they were mixing it they had massive Mackie mixers that they were mixing everything through and it was that that created the energy perhaps in those in those situations that you don't that you don't perhaps get I'm saying perhaps a lot because you know I don't think there's any real real answers to it that that perhaps you don't get when playing or writing on a door mm. I think it's just yeah, I don't know I think the stuff that you would mix and do spontaneously that you it's just sort of a linear arranger. I don't know. I just, I, I would not, I wouldn't choose to do it. But then also the other thing I was going to say is that you can set that up, you know, using Ableton Live, that whole piece of software is pretty much designed to make that possible because of the, you know, the linear, the session view, session view. Yes. And mm -hmm. um, top down, you know, and if you've got like a MIDI slider thing, then you can do mixer jams, just dubby mixer jams, hit record, 
that is and Ableton Live feels like it was designed to encourage that process. You know, you would work out all your sections and then you do your live dub and then you've got a version of it in the computer that you can finish off. And so it's, it feels like it has the perfect balance. Although a lot of the time I tend to, I think as I've, I've used that since like version four of like probably 17 years now. Um, and I almost feel like I've gotten to habit habitual in that I tend to use it a bit more. I either use it like Cubase, you know, old Cubase used to be, or I'll just use it in that range of view and not, not get things finished. So it's, I mean, we're talking about DAWs here, but it sort of, mm. it does illustrate there is, and it's since fit into this, but it's, I don't know. I think the main thing is to have some, you've just got to have an intent. And it's, I think, that is a thing that gets lost. What I was going to say before is that idea of compartmentalizing things. It's important to compartmentalize the sort of buying process and just say, look, this is my stuff and this is what I'm going to do with it. And that you, you know, how can you do it? And there's, there's ways it's, if you've just got a computer, you can still have a very hardware way of working. And actually the other thing is, mm. yeah, it's sort of the, that's the sort of one thing that, with hardware synths particularly, there is my feeling is that I certainly, I really do enjoy my messing around with software synths and I do enjoy the, there's just insane sound possibilities. And that's something that there's a whole branch you can talk about, you know, in terms of digital synthesis, um, you know, Max MSP and the sort of the scope of building like almost music machines so I th i'm thinking particularly if you listen to orteca's music for the last sort of 10 or more years is a lot of it has been well more than that has been max msp based kind of lots of fm synthesis lots of you know complex use of modulated delays and really wonderful like sound design um and as far as i can tell a lot of that music is done as a kind of live jam, I have to assume this, that mm. it's kind of live jammed, you know, in Max MSP and they probably recorded the output and then chopped up and layered and done, I'm sure they've done more to it, but, you know, they're really using the computer for what it does so well, which is just m like almost the m biggest, most expensive modular you could ever afford, you know, or you could never afford, you know, is what they can build very easily in Max. And they've talked in interviews where they say, you know, people are like, oh, have you got X so-and-so synth or this so-and-so synth? And they're like, no, we don't. We're not excited by that. We just, anytime I'm excited about some new piece of equipment, I just get myself more excited about learning it in Max MSP. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> Which is a uh, <laughs> level of discipline that I just simply, as you can tell, I simply do not have. Like, And I mm. would be interested to learn max msp but i just think i don't know it feels like another thing to learn i have enough trouble like learning you know doing really modular things with the modules that i have i use modular in a very simplistic way i would say mm -hmm. not doing anything particularly clever um, and i think to do really clever things is expensive like you do need a lot of modules and lots of utilities um but uh i was gonna say that you know with hardware since it's there's that thing that just because there's, you know, a real, like if I, I don't own anything that has a plug-in equivalent, you know what I mean? And none of the synths I own have like a virtual synth equivalent, but um, I I definitely prefer, I just because I, I'm not saying this very well, basically, I would much rather spend an afternoon jamming on a real hardware synth to explore sound design versus necessarily doing that on software, I think. But then mm. I have spent, I've certainly spent evenings until very early in the morning messing with soft synths and, and exploring that too. It's just that I think, I don't know, there's sort of different, I don't know. No, this is does, does it come down to interface? Does it ultimately come down to that tactile? function you know trying to use a mouse as a creative tool yeah i think it that is exactly it it's the mouse it's nothing to do with the soft synth it's just the mouse and that's actually why i'm particularly one thing i made a note of is you know these new macs which i'm quite i'm initially wasn't that excited by i must say but i am getting excited by because those seem very 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 powerful 
which means lots and lots of instances of soft synths that you can run you know uh, like you've got a room full of actual gear and you don't have to worry about you know minimal latency and snappy response and all that good stuff and lots of them where you don't have to freeze them and you can just work quickly that seems very exciting but particularly the thing that um i have to assume must be coming is because they've announced the macbook and they've announced like the mac mini and the mac pro and stuff but they haven't announced an imac and i am sure surely that the iMac will be full 10 finger multi touch. Like the iMac has to be a big iPad, like a really big desktop iPad. And and the very idea of like a 40 inch iPad, I think is going to be incredible. And of course, like, you know, as yourself, you you like done loads of stuff with those Microsoft surfaces and mm. Microsoft kind of did this already and will probably be very annoyed when when Apple do it and, and everyone's like, hang on, this is amazing. And we're like, well, we did this, we did this. <laughs> um, it tends to be the case that Apple sort of, you know, they aren't the first people to do it, but they often are the ones that kind of make it an everyday reality for a lot of people. Yeah, they drive it. I mean, it is already there with the iPad. Uh, I mean, the the amazing thing that happened with that piece of technology when whether it's gaming or whether it's music making as as well bringing touch elements and and to making developers understand how touch works is brilliant it's just it's a struggle to translate it to the desktop it, it always seems to have been have been so but it, it does happen I me mean, for instance i've got just over my shoulder there i've got the the 2600 from cherry audio is running on my surface over there in the distance and that's fully touch you know all fingers and that's great. It is a little is bit small, perhaps, but if you were to run it on a Surface Studio or, as you say, an, an iMac, if they did such a thing, it would be it would be great. But it is different. I mean, there's there's no way that you can say that a touchscreen works in any. It doesn't give you that haptic sense of uh, having having one's fingers on controls. You know that mm -hmm. it's it's good. It's useful, um, but it's. It's never going to replace a you know a hardware, a hardware experience. I don't think. It's yeah. There is a, and it's also muscle memory. It's the the, mm. you know, like I have a Juno sixty, and I've had that since for fifteen, so years, maybe twelve. No, maybe not as long as that. But you know, that's a good example of a synth where like I know it back to front. I do. I can close my eyes and you know make a sound and that sort of thing. You know, it, that is amazing and I suppose that's why I'm interested in the I'm, well on the iMac thing well the idea of like a touchscreen iMac is it's partly to do with like having the power of it but and it is partly to do with the muscle memory but I think also I think it will be really interesting to see um, if that becomes a reality there is a chicken and egg problem here where we need developers to make multi-touch DAWs, you know, that really take advantage of those computers. Um, and so I'm particularly interested to see sort of DAWs that take advantage of those multi-touch because then you can do things that just aren't possible in hardware. You know, you can, mm. like there are certain arterial plugins where you like push the thing and like a panel lifts up and stuff and exposes more guts to you. And you could just, you can have all this, there's the possibility of interface with you know, a big real estate multi-touch screen, I think is very exciting, especially, you know, for synths or what. you can then have like, you know, an LFO, the cutoff and resonance that is like an XY pad, but that also has physics and is, mm. there's a little ball and I can like flick the ball and it'll bounce around in a, you know, in the little, the range and I can adjust gravity and things that, you know, things mm. that just hardware synths can't do, like, and, and things that where it will contact sensitive, like the interface can change related to what you're doing. Those are possibilities, things that yes. by its very nature, hardware is fixed. It can never yeah. change itself. But a software instrument could be a, like amorphous and malleable and change to flex to your, your needs. And, and I've, you know, with the podcast, at the end of every podcast I've done, my podcast that is, it's I ask someone what is the future of music technology, and I, you know, there isn't always one defined answer to that, but a lot of kind of a lot of the answers hint at 
interface. You know, it's mm. the sort of, I feel the interface is the future because I think, I don't know, what, have we checked in with Moore to see how Moore's law is doing? But I mean, we're, you know, obviously these M1s are supposed to be a big leap in CPU, but are we not getting to a point where, like, the, you know, it's not about the power, it's more about how we interact with it? Mm. Yeah, no, I think, I think that's true. I mean, the thing that, that jumped up at me, I mean, somebody in the chat suggested that using a, a touchscreen is hard on the arms. And it is and it isn't. I mean, playing a keyboard is hard on the arms. You know, reaching for modular is hard on the arms. Um, I think things, I think in a more virtual sense, I mean, I've played with a lot of uh, different um, uh, virtual adaptations, I suppose, over the years. Some kind of leap motion thing where you're waving your arms about or you've got a ring on that that's controlling things. And those ache because you're not resting on anything. Your arms are in the air. The same with virtual reality. Your arms are holding things and you're in the air. And that's a real drag. And, you know, it's like we, we push out into the idea of an interface and then we come back thinking, well, actually, this is bloody useful because I can do I can write a symphony with tiny, tiny movements and sit mm. here eating pizza and drinking beer and not having to exercise at all. And that's extraordinary. But then we feel ourselves trapped into that single point of light and think, but well, then I want to reach out again. So, you know, we, we are going in these waves of of interface. But. I mean, mm. the, something that interests me recently is this. Do you know the SoundForce controllers? Um, yeah. Guy at SoundForce it, it, who creates a controller for a single soft synth, which just seems crazy. But at the same time, it it introduces a hardware workflow. Yeah, um, not at all. I think it's, to run fact, a piece of software. I suggested one to him, and he's making it, which is the Jupiter Eight, like a Jupiter Eight, you know, controller. Because I was like, you could make a. You know, that's one. Personally speaking, again, you know, hence mm. I love you know the Juno sixty. Um, I also really love the Jupiter, and I kind of you know, obviously, I wish I had one, but you know, money. Um, it's just it's sort of north of ten thousand for one of those things now. So, mm. yeah, I was like, you should do an interface. You could do it, and it would be so nice to have an interface. You know, and I, if I had that, I'd use it for the plugin. I would use mm. it to. So you you would then begin to build that muscle memory, and actually the he. I mean, as a random aside for that particular product, it could then also be a controller for like the MKS 70 and like various other Roland synths that had this sort of little DIN, but it's not DCB and it's not MIDI, but anyway, um, it can have a double duty as a hardware editor and a software one. And I, th I really like that idea, the idea of having a dedicated controller for software. And actually one of the things that I've, I've talked about, again on the podcast, is this idea of, wouldn't it be interesting to have like, I mean, what I'm almost describing sounds like the Ableton push, but basically imagine having a kind of software groove box that you build and there's a dedicated controller for it, but all of the guts are in your computer. You know, I'm sort of describing something that is a bit like, a, yeah. you know, a bit like an MPC and a bit like a push, but perhaps a dedicated interface that has knobs for everything and sliders and faders but it's it's running kind of a couple of synth engines and some drum engines and that's and you could almost perform it would be like an instrument but mm. the software would i mean maybe it would be better done as a hardware thing but i've often thought like if you've got vcv rack which is something that's worth mentioning but you know as a, a wonderful a wonderful example of the software v hardware thing is i mean a vcv rack is the free version it's like a having a free modular synth you know whereas the cost to entry of modular is so extreme and vcv is putting in some instances like the actual code for mutable instruments modules is in that software and it's so you can sort of get access to things which you'd otherwise have to pay hundreds of pounds for and that's amazing mm. and what would be even more amazing would be basically you could build a performance patch in your computer and then map a midi controller to it so you know i have somewhere here over here i've got my performance modular i've often thought like i i should put together like a vcv sort of patch and then map it to like a common controller like you know I'm trying to think that you know like a mm -hmm. like the arch but like any sort of midi controller like with a standard bank of eight faders and 16 mm -hmm. knobs um it would be really interesting to see what you could put like put together so you, could yeah. you make it was like a, a performance instrument that used software since the software modular since but was gave you a real physical thing to interact mm. with i think it'd be worth 
worth a try. Yeah, I mean, I think we're on the way to that somewhere. I mean, I'm reminded of Tim Exile and his flow machine. You know, he sort of mm. created a, 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 a way of controlling Reactor through all of these different interfaces. And of course, we have MIDI controllers. It's just that they're a bit generic. You don't get the sense of an instrument, I think, with a, with a generic yeah. MIDI controller. Um, there's also modular ones that you can kind of create your own, but they end up getting expensive. And then do you, you know, how do you tailor that down? But then we've got MIDI 2.0, which is trying to suggest that we can have this two-way conversation between MIDI controller and software and mm. hardware. And so they all, excuse me, they all, all automatically find each other somehow and map themselves to each other. But I think until we have until we have a some kind of surface which morphs into physical controls, you know, like I'm thinking of uh, of Man of Steel, you know, on on Krypton, and they had the the holographic kind of very metallic uh, communication things that grew out of stuff. Anyway, oh, really, I'm not saying that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, there was yeah. a company that had like stick on knobs for the iPad, wasn't there at some point? Oh yes. Right. S yes. Yes, there was. Also for the surface. In fact, I had. I had something which was a foot controller that Bluetoothed up to this thing that clamped onto the side of the surface and would push buttons for you via the foot thing. Okay. Which you're playing guitar, you're trying to turn a page, I think was the basic idea, but I tried to repurpose it into all sorts of things, into some kind of Frankenstein, hit a button, change a patch kind of... Uh, it wasn't great. Worth, well, worth a try. <laughs> the other one is the... I have got an Oculus Rift, and I have sort of looked at a bit at the kind of... Mm. VR sort of interfaces. I mean, that's obviously all software, but then it's that to me is almost like a weird halfway house where you it's all software, but because it's VR, it feels real. And there's, yes. I don't know. If there's, I'm not, I'm yet to be convinced by a lot of what I've seen in terms of this sort of music creation for Oculus seems to be more like it's pretending there is real hardware. And I, in a way, I'm like, you should embrace what is only possible because you're in the the magical virtual world where there's no limitation physical limitations no longer exist and you know using the controllers themselves as kind of you know six dimensional kind of control inputs it would be interesting but damn you know, yeah so just... somebody uh, asked in the chat actually why doesn't software map itself to a controller why well, doesn't that I... happen it does if you buy i mean yeah, again, name dropping, but the Arturia thing is the well. If you buy like the Key Lab and those do map, so but that's only to Analog Lab. Also, well, they do map mm. to, I think they map to the DAWs, but they certainly to the Analog Lab thing. Yeah. But um, I think as you're talking about with MIDI 2.0, that is part of it, isn't it? That mm. there's they sort of do there is more bi-directional communication. The point is to get that now. You have to buy a specific bit of kit that's designed yeah. to work with a specific bit of software. Because MIDI, MIDI is stupid, you know. MIDI doesn't have any any brains at all. It's, it's it just goes in it goes in one direction. It just spills out of a cable, you know. So there's nothing to tell one piece of MIDI gear a piece of software, mm. another piece of MIDI gear a controller. There's nothing to tell. There's no conversation, you know. It's well, really d data a going on limited extent. But you need mm. a, you know, there is obviously bi-directional. I mean, one example is the and I've got here. Um, one of these iPad things in a Alesis um, oh, yeah, yeah. Iodoc, um, which, you know, I got this secondhand because I was like, A, it gives you some dedicated outs when we're here. There yes. they are. Um, but it also gives you MIDI, which, um, which if you use patch base, which is the um, iPad, it's like an iPad editor, using patch base, you've got um, multi-touch um, editors for synths so you know I've mm, yeah. got it to use with like Matrix 1000, JV1080 TX81 Z um, and that does support obviously bi-directional MIDI um, means that it can sniff out the patch that's in the synth and then put it on the screen for you and you can edit it and then I think I mean it doesn't do any of this but you, it does randomize so then you start to get into the interesting world where with you know using a computer to control hardware means i can have virtual lfos and patch randomization like oh getting crap the um the hydra synth is a good example of a synth that has randomization built as you know there is actually a button somewhere uh there's mm -hmm. a button on it for randomization and it's something that you can add if you have an obviously um you know polybrute has the morphing thing um 
And I don't know if you can do more things through patch base. I don't think are there are certain things I have heard, you know, there are certain bits of um, editors that do have more thing where you can, you know, blend, create hybrid babies of two patches and something you just can't do unless the synth like the polybrew is obviously designed for it and it's part mm. of build. And so it's, there's more to it. Like with the polybrew, you can modulate it with LFOs and things like that. You can't do that with this, but um, what I'm getting at is that, if you're creative, you can extend the functionality of a lot of these synths using software, even though they're hardware. So it's, I like that, like mm. the idea that software can push your hardware around in interesting ways. There was a synth that came out just, I think it was yesterday, called Brain Synth. This is a software synthesizer. And the, the, the idea behind this is that it has algorithms built in or a, a method of, of randomizing or itself that is artificially intelligent. And I mean, I for one, I welcome our artificially intelligent synthesizer overlords. Oh, wow. <laughs> intelligent. Yes. Um, is that intelligent but, dance music? Is that what it makes? Um, it's difficult to say because there are no sound demos or a video. So all you've got is <laughs> all you've got is the web page so far, and it'll cost you twelve dollars to find out. But um, is it, what's it called? Uh, Brain synth. It's from I can tell you. Not Brian's. Uh, the Nathan. The Nathan or Venatan. Venatan, like Jonathan. Almost, but no H at the end. So then mm. Atan. I'm, I'm I'm struggling to find this. My Google Kung Fu has failed me, but that sounds intriguing. Okay. Brain synth. Yeah, very interesting. It does. I mean, it's it's got a a twelve voice synth behind it, behind the interface mm. of this pulsating brain. Um, but you know th things like things like probability and randomization are things which are done differently in software and hardware. I mean, probability in hardware is usually to do as whether something fires or not, whereas in software synthesis it tends to be baked into everything. So you can hit a button, hit a nice dice button, and we come up with a whole a whole other patch. That's a yeah. I I like when software does softwarey things. You know, goes yeah. beyond what hardware can offer. That's and it's that thing of you know in GUI design as well like skeuomorphism versus mm. you know flat color as well as debates obviously raging debates about those things but from a practical standpoint too it's interesting that yeah what is possible and what is not it's a tricky one like I you know I, there are lots of plugins that are made to look like real bits of kit and I think um, personally I think it makes sense because you know if you're trying to sort of create the sense that you really do have access to the thing um it needs to then be laid out and work like the thing does so it's just it's just kind of a bit of a given but it is interesting to think about what is you know what only a computer could do mm. there's uh, is it Laurie Spiegel's is it Laurie Spiegel who created this there's like some software that's like I think it was for like the Amiga or something and it's called like, you know, mouse performer or something like this. And you, like, you wave the mouse like a conductor's wand and sort of this was kind of in the early, you know, early days of personal computers. And it's, um, I think it's called like MIDI mouse. And I've, there's some, someone did, there was a really cool video with someone doing something with it. I've probably got all of the names wrong and I can't remember the name of the video. So that's not a great, story. <laughs> but, but the point is that there's, you know, it's interesting that I did like, I, but, you know, you could do fun things like by waving the mouse. You could be conducting, and maybe we've lost. I don't know. There's lots of specialist controllers now to help us kind of get more into the computer data-wise. But I still think that the the obvious one is multi-touch. I think if we can just get our dirty little mitts into the computer a bit more easily, I think there's just I don't know. I think there's a lot of possibility. Like the whole. Did you play around with the Lima thing when it was? Yes. Well, yeah, a little bit, because um, that was, well, that was a bit aspirational at the time. It was really, really, really expensive. And then it was a $10 app, kind of like yeah. overnight. Well, <laughs> is... they invented it, and then they invented the iPad at the same time, which was yes. unfortunate. Um, yeah. <laughs> good for us, but um, not if you were you're like, it democratized the the touchscreen concept. So, mm. but I've, I have got Lima, the, you know, but I never did much with it. And it was... But it, it, I bring it up because cause it does have a lot of those, like, you know, the physics ball and the sort of, there were mm. kind of, um, you know, tools in there that you could apply to music making and synth sounds. And so you could be using little, like, everything could be being animated by, you know, it's the idea that, like, 
there'd be like LFOs built into the controls themselves. The controls themselves could have, you could flick the light cut yes. off and it could hit the end and bounce back. And well, you need to look at uh, you need to look at Hollyhock from Usign if you've never come across that. Uh, that is a, a piece of software which I've tried many, many times to find a space that I can sit down and work it out because it's very touchable. Um, it does all of those kind of physics things. It looks like, well, it has, I guess it has a max DSP feel to it, but it's a bit more colorful, thankfully. And um, it does absolutely lend itself to that in a multi-touch environment. It can do all sorts of weird stuff. Somewhere in there, it's a door as well. But it often feels like a mass of strange machines and windows and stuff going on. Um, but it that looks, yeah, that is a, an amazing piece of work. But I think yeah. I've I've never quite got over the you know the the bar to entry <laughs> quite. You need to spend a day, I think, just going right. Okay, I'm yeah, going to work this not, one out. A day would not be enough for me. It's uh, yeah, <laughs> probably a few weeks to get my head around it. The that does look really cool, and it's I love that there's stuff like that still happening do you know what i mean there's mm. and there is sort of specialized sound design tools like um kima is it kima or kima um kima kima that is the thing isn't it um which i've never played with but is a sort of um it's a like you know dedicated piece of hardware dsp sound design is used a lot for like uh, film sound like i know that ben burt does lots of you know does the sound of wally is him with a Actually, there's some videos where he's got a Wacom tablet and he's using a Wacom pen and he's going like, wally, but, you know, and it's adjusting his voice, but he's using a pen to do it. I was thought it was quite mm, interesting. Interesting. Like, is that this to, like, save your hand or, you know, I have seen this, I've seen some, like, animation videos where there's people and they're using Wacom tablets as the input method with a pen instead of a mouse. I don't know if it's better for your hand or if you can be more expressive, probably a mm. little bit. It's like lugging a mouse around is kind of, Depends on the mouse, but yeah. I know you can get mice that you can sort of. I'm like this mouse, I've got, I've got the G502, and it came with weights. It has multiple sets of weights that you can put into the mouse to like add sort of you know inertia and stuff to it, so you can like get. I don't know. Mm. It's like it's for like gaming, but I did wonder. I was like, maybe I could. I don't know. Squidge a virtual cutoff dial a little bit more authentically if I have just the the weights in just the right place. There is a, an element of, of ergonomics in this as well, I suppose. There's, I mean, for me, the relief of getting up and going and standing over by my modular is is something palpable that I can really grasp these days. Particularly at my age, I think in my younger days, I, I could I, I could spend a week in a position at my computer and that seemed to be fine. You know, I would unfold mm. myself uh, later on to go and order pizza and then go back to it. But these days I can't do that. I have to, I can't stay here. I can't stay at the computer. And so that has, has had a genuine impact on my uh, creativity, on the amount of time I can spend. I mean, largely I'm now at a computer to either write or you know, to write words or to edit video, funnily enough. Uh, for, for music, I can, now, I can now step away and that's good for me physically. Um, not just in a in a creative space, but the reality of uh, carpal tunnel, the reality of uh, you know I've had to spend money on an expensive chair, you know all of these sorts of things um, have pushed me into hardware to some degree, you know, mm. and that's no bad thing. That's a that's a you know, a positive outcome that I don't. I'm quite relieved that there's so much hardware available, so many places I can go that don't require me to sit in front of a computer. Mm. So there's another angle. Do you have it at your modular at standing level, or is it? Well, the benches behind me, I built those for building computers on. So I would stand and lean over into a computer to, to, to build mm. it. So they're sort of work bench height, I suppose. And so my modular sits on them and is at such a height that I can sit in a chair in front of it, but I don't have to. Mm. Uh, it's kind of somewhere in between. So it's, it's quite, it's high um, when compared to a desk but um, not so high that I can't sit on my chair and, and lean into it so mm. I can vary my, my position with it I suppose you don't have the rising desks like the stand you know there's like desks with hydraulics oh yes yeah 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 I went to um, the Genelec factory once in Finland and they the stations where they actually test and build like 8000 series Genelecs 
like these are like customized workstations and they're on hydraulics as well so like exactly the same way like people building the speakers in the factory can raise and lower the entire like mm. work but they're like a custom not just like a table like a whole custom sort of divided like area built for building speakers i always thought that was amazing and i've i really want one of those desks that can move up and down um, just for that exact reason as you say like the like i have yeah actually that's interesting my yeah i've got um so my side here got um this which is the sort of the table that's just got my modular on um and some like other bits and bobs you can see <laughs> slightly crazy high is the uh i've got the, <laughs> like the loki, loki stands um but it's it's nice to have that at, at standing height so my performance yeah. module is at standing height but actually i've enjoyed playing it sitting down someone did leave a comment they were like you know i can't believe you play this sitting down like i'd have to stand and sort of done both but i'm with you on that whole when you get and stand get up stand up um you know when you stand up for your right uh it is yeah it's nice to do that like it i don't know there is an argument that you write different music when you're stood up yes. versus that down there's the sort of obviously you can move your body and be free and i've kind of got it stood up because i would i my gut reaction would be having it sat down but because you play gigs stood up then it's almost like it's, it's better to build that muscle memory mm. of like you know practicing gigs in the same physical state like i stood up um Never mind having a couple of pints or anything, but like, um, but yeah, it's stood up. But, like but you, you get to that situation then when you turn up at the gig and they've just got a trestle table, which is far too low, and yeah, you go, yeah. oh, and my modular goes down there that I can't yeah. see, and it's dark, and as you say, you're two pints into the game by this because you're not on till half midnight. And exactly. You're, and you're like, I can't see, and I can't, where is everything? Um, yeah, yeah, but I mean, one of the, one of the software hardware things that, that I think about often is that um, software should, in my view, always show destinations for modulation graphically, animatedly, and that's the one thing that it does really well. I think you, know, mm. you go to a, go to a software synth and you can see what's being modulated because things are wanging around, or lights, or something is going on that's showing you what's going on. You then turn to your piece of hardware and you're going, "I've no clue. I've no clue where anything is." Where yeah. is going i mean it's i've recently been using the the modal uh, cobalt 8 which is a nice synth as i, as I said to you before mm. but it's all encoders yeah, encoders are great they're fine no problem with that it's just that as soon as you change a patch well even before you change the patch because there's no indication there's no hint of anything you know the knob's not ever pointing to anything but whenever you change a patch on a hardware synth that has that facility nothing is pointing to anything that it should be anymore so there's yeah. no visual clues as to what that sound would be. And I find that enormously helpful. That's something I find very helpful in software, that when you change a patch, everything changes. And modulation is showing you where it's going. And the, I suppose the, the distinction that I'm drawing is that in, in modular, which, which doesn't show you anything either, it, and it, it forces, forces a different way of creating on you. So in software, I can see what's happening. I can tailor those and tweak those. In modular, I have to use my ears or I have to explore, mm. which is when you then discover other things and new things you weren't expecting. And I think that's a really interesting difference I find in how I work with software and hardware. Software is very deliberate, I think. <laughs> modular is is a lot more accidental, a lot more exploratory. How it do, can you, be, yeah. do you find that? Yeah, no, I definitely, I know what you're saying completely. That's why I like Roland synths as well, um, because there's a lot of faders, uh, so you can just see mm. where everything is. It's, so it's a very visual way to work. Um, you know, like the Atlantis as well is another good. It's a module that does that, where it's just like there it is. I, know, I can almost tell you what it's doing just from one glance. Um, it's, yeah, it's tricky. The whole thing of anywhere where there's any kind of visual feedback can be. It can be a blessing and a curse, like in the modular mm. world, the computer music world, or in any world where you've got meters and you know frequency, like um, you know waterfall frequency displays that are showing you what's happening with the frequency spectrum. I mean, those can be hugely helpful because they, you know, you don't have to rely completely on your ears, you know. And if you're hard of hearing, or if you have hearing problems, and you're not good at hearing certain frequencies, is you know, as we all get older, we all lose some of our higher, you know, we lose our high end gradually. And 
um, of course it can be damaged um, then it's really important that you have visual feedback and that's mm. something that's in the software world it's very easy to have eqs that actually show you the, the frequency response dancing around and in the hardware world that's it doesn't i mean it does exist but it's it's either expensive or, yeah. or crude you know you have these 19 inch rack things that that have lots of led bar graphs and give you a crude representation of what's going on but um there's it's true that there's far better visualization to be had and that can make you a better producer if you know what you're looking for um, but mm. i suppose the, the problem is just when it becomes habit forming and you sort of you almost visually mix and yes. you, you're not audibly mix. and so i remember i can't remember who said this or where but there's I remember this example of someone talking about a, a professional music studio, a producer, and he taped over all of the meters. All of the meters had like, you know, opaque tape over them. So he couldn't see them. So he had to listen. So he couldn't use meters as a cheat to see whether he was in the right place. And he wasn't like, overdriving something or whatnot. You know, he had to, had to listen. And that, there's a lot to be said for that. Mm. Um, you know, and in the software world, I mean, I have talked about this where wouldn't it be cool if there was a, like, when you hit space bar in Ableton Live, the screen went black. Uh, someone pointed out, you could just close your eyes. Uh, <laughs> which would do the same thing. <laughs> just free of charge and an instant update. Uh, so I recommend if you just hit space bar, close your eyes so that you're really listening and you're not just looking at the little thing moving across and waiting for things to come in. And yeah, it's yeah. It, it's it's a, it's a blessing and a curse, but I think what we're getting at is a lot of it comes down to discipline and habits. And you know, you can, if you're fortunate, you, and if you're thinking about it consciously, then you can use this gear in a way that's um, you know very measured and deliberate. And you're using what's great about soft synths for what they're great at, and what's great about hardware synths for what they're great at. And but it's it is hard. There's a lot to take in there's a lot to consider and with all of these tools there's so many different ways they can be used that it's almost overwhelming and it's easy to lose sight of of goals and it's easy to go outside the little box that you put for yourself but whatever it takes it's worth something that's worth thinking about it's a good debate to have and just reminding yourself like if you've you know if you're using software set some limitations and if you're using hardware set some limitations as well um, because in hardware, it's tempting to buy more stuff. In software, mm -hmm. it's tempting to buy more stuff. And it's also tempting to just pile on more sounds. What I would say is when I've done hardware jams, like one of the best things about doing hardware jams is that I avoid, there's a, there's a thing I've noticed when I'm making music in the computer, it's often tempting to keep adding sounds versus working harder on the ones that you've already got in there. So yes. that could mean if I'm using soft synths, then it could well mean that I'm, have I worked hard enough to create enough musical variation? And, you know, could I be just, instead of just piling on and piling on and piling on and piling on. Um, and when I make do hardware jams, because I can't just pile on hardware and I've got maybe three things that I'm using at once, three synths or whatever it is, then I just have to work harder at the MIDI. Do you know what I mean? I have to work mm. harder at actually getting a good riff with them so that and and if that riff's boring and i have to work out hard i have to create another one so it's that that is yeah in both mm. cases you can work around this but in both cases it requires in i don't know in a hardware world it it still requires discipline because it's tempting to just keep buying things as a sort of solution rather than you know stick with what you've got and use it for a while and then make some music with it and then think about what you might like to do next well, it's becoming an instrument. That's the thing. Hardware lends itself to being an instrument. And so the time that you spend on it is learning how to wrestle sounds from that in some in a performance way. You don't have to perform with software. You can, you know, it's again, it's 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 beauty and it's and it's bad thing in that you can just tap in notes, any old notes, or you can get something like uh, something like Riffer or an arpeggiator or something which can generate notes for you you don't even have to come up with a tune you can just let it let it play let it run and play around with notes without ever having to learn how to play anything and i'm not saying that that you must learn to play an instrument but having hardware gives you that opportunity at least and it means that the more you play with it potentially the more you'll get out of it and the more you'll be able to do with it mm. Mm. yeah sure 
So let's talk about Storm then. <laughs> <laughs> so my first experience yeah, of Arturia. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we, yeah, yeah. Uh, we were distributor for Arturia in uh, at Turnkey many years ago. Yeah. So it came under my uh, rest its soul. Turnkey. Yeah. I, yeah, indeed. Been, everyone's worked there at some point. I've worked there as well. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I was. Um, I had to demo it to people on the shop floor and convince people that that virtual scratching was a thing that we could that we could do and was fun. And virtual it was. instruments. Yeah. Like full stop. Really. Yeah. I mean, it was remarkable actually that they kind of went from this this fun rebirth esque piece of software to a mini moog. You know, mm. it seemed to be like an enormous step from this uh, uh, this sort of fruity, funky little 303 type synth uh, with a drum machine and, um, as I say, a little bit of vinyl scratching in there, which looked like a house. It looked like you're having a house party with different floors, with different things going on. Look it up if, if you've never seen it before. I've it's never, I've actually never it's seen funny. that. Before. That's amazing. <laughs> but it's, Why not? Yeah, yeah. But they seem to go from that to a thoroughly endorsed from Bog Moog himself, uh, Mini Moog emulation which was amazing really you know and it's still part of their uh, their synth collection now yeah it is and it's yeah that whole thing is it is amazing like the whole uh, i do think well, it makes me sound really old i'm like kids today you know it's absolutely amazing what i've got to work with but it is true like if you've you know if you have very little money like you don't need to feel bad about not owning hardware. Do you know what I mean? It's, I think mm. it is just one of those, it looks so cool. Obviously, you know, cool things with like dials are cool, but it isn't necessary. Like it's not a given and it's the quality of music you make is not related to what you own or whether you have software and hardware. The, it, neither mm. of those will guarantee great results necessarily. It is, uh, the risk of stating the bleeding obvious it is that it's the chef that is making the meal not the you know not just the ingredients so it's uh, no matter what you've got you can feel good that you've got what you need to make great music it's it can be done like there's no there's really no bad gear i find <laughs> like in my experience maybe some misunderstood gear and and maybe yeah. some gear it's like could be less expensive so that you know more people could have it if that makes sense but it's um there are options is the point and there's no matter what you your aspirations are if you want to make music you can do it with free plugins and free daws and free everything um you know well your computer hopefully not free um otherwise <laughs> you've got to talk to the police but um the but yeah exactly but if you've got a decent computer but not even computer your phone like you know it's the whole the whole ios music thing and ipad based music is just unbelievable i mean i'm and that's another thing i've i've kind of only really dabbled in that and i know that's not technically what it's sort of what we're talking about today but it's um you know ios music is it's just nuts i mean but mm. arguably your phone is still quite expensive it's just as expensive as buying a laptop so that maybe doesn't carry over but lots of us already have phones and you know yes. android phones are, are possibly less expensive and it's the point is there's options for and not having something is not an excuse i would say to not getting results that you're happy with it won't make those results you know it won't just magically make them up and if you're really disciplined you know if if there was things about the hardware workflow that excited you then you could be using low cost midi controllers to to explore that too if you were creative and you know as we were talking about maybe with the cv rack you could make your own you know you could make a patch that just like in my modular synth that you know, when I've had to ensure that thing for taking it out to gigs, it just, I always have to like sob into a pillow, you know, <laughs> what it costs. It's, it's a lot, you know, it's yeah. a lot. Of money and it, I don't, you know, I say I don't need it, but I would say, you know, that modular synth is a good example that what is great about modular synths is, and, you know, if we're talking about interfaces and, and how to make music is you can make your dream synth machine. You know, something that is a complete self-contained music production environment, an instrument truly like. Mm. But like I was saying, you know, it does everything. It has drums, it has synths, it bass, and, and it has the sequencing. And it can be made to work in a very simple way so that you only interact with a few controls and a lot of things can happen. If you're clever, you can make that happen. Um, 
and but you can do that with software too and that's what Orteca mm. are doing so I mean but then Orteca have been doing it for decades and it's you know just as I've been working with Modular for a long time I, I was trying to think with Eurorack probably eight or nine years but you know, I've had other modules since before that, but they, at the end of the day, it's the it's the chef. It's the chef. Yeah, it is. Now, I find one of the nice things about um, physical modular is that it's an instrument which grows and evolves over time. As you as you understand more things, you then understand. Oh, I'm, I might need this because I can understand how that's going to change the way that I'm working. And that, that development, I think, is interesting. You also make wrong turns as well. You go, wow, look at that. I must buy that. Stick that in there and go, I have no clue how that does anything. And, you know, you might then um, discover it or you might bypass it and, and move on. But it's it's a machine that, that evolves. And that doesn't really happen so much in software. So if you were to get hold of VCV Rack, for instance, you've suddenly got this enormous modular system, which can be a, a terribly overwhelming. And mm. how on earth do you make any of it work? Although I have to say that you need to seek out some of the community presets that are out there because they are mm. extraordinary. And there's a whole load of them which are based on the basic modules that you get within VCV Rack. So go and, and seek those out and just explore what they're doing. Because otherwise you're sitting there with, with this almost limitless supply of modules going, well, I don't know what to do, which is a common software conundrum, I think, that you have... It too much yeah. choice and so can't make a start you know yeah the limitless options of a computer is that is a it is a problem and that's what's good about the hardware in a way that if you've got if you can't afford too much stuff but a bit then you work really hard to squeeze the most you can but i would you know i would also say just watch you know there's videos i've made there's videos other people have made where it's like hey here's how my modular works mm. and if you've got vcv rack then you can just watch all these hardware videos and the key point would be you try and distill the core essence of what they're trying to do. You know, I can explain the sequencing concept that my modular uses. It's very simple. And you can so apply that theory to VCV and it, it will make your life a lot easier, I think, rather than... So it's it's you can draw on so much um, material that's out there through YouTube and, and stuff. And, you, and it, you can look at all the hardware stuff. The key point is to look at those videos and distill what it is that you're trying to do um I, and if it's i think with a lot of the modular thing part of the problem is that i don't you know to speak very generally i do think a lot of people are like it just looks cool oh mm. just it's i want to try this and see what it's about and i think you do have to ask a difficult question which is what are you getting into it to do um mm. and if you can just answer that question that will help a lot um because it's it's those things where you see people that have posted a picture of their modular and there's a gap in the case and it's like what should i put in there you know i think i find that a weird question like what should I, i've got a gap how do i fill it i feel like if you've if you're using it if you're actually using it it should be obvious to you what you you're struggling to do do you know what i mean like if you were using it that would be answered by its by just using it <laughs> mm. you shouldn't need to just ask it like it implies that by asking the public hey what should i do is implying like you've never even turned it on or you're using it do you know what i mean it's like for me if i'm playing with my live modular synth i'm there is a lot that i know i can do with it and it's you know, it, it seems obvious to me i'm like i'm struggling on this one thing because i'm using it and i'm learning that i can't do that thing does that make sense it's just mm. I always found it a bit odd but then it isn't i know i know that people don't necessarily have defined goals when they get into those things and especially if something's free that is another factor is the reality of you know expensive things are hard to get hold of and they're expensive but if you've made a commitment to buy something then it does kind of force you to learn it because you're like it's mm. all i've got i've just spent loads of money on this so <laughs> either I get something out of this or I'm in trouble. Um, mm. I, I talked to uh, Lady Starlight um, and she talked about the Octatrack and she was like, um, you know, I bought that thing. And she's like, and she says, and I, I was almost in tears on like the first weekend. She was like, I paid so much money for this. And I can't <laughs> anything out of it which made me laugh. But she was, I know exactly what she's talking about. It's just like, oh my God, this thing is deep 
and it, I'm not sure it's going to do what I want. And and that there is that is that is a reality that I think many people have faced, when you, especially there's some very deep tools. But you know, she persevered with it, and it becomes an integral part. And that that is an indispensable for many people an indispensable piece of kit. I know. Mm. Um, and it but it takes work, and you're you're I think you're more inclined to do it if it's a more costly device. Um, because I, I just I worry about that sort of, especially in the case of like free plugins and stuff. Sure, it might be tempting to just load up on them, but do you ever put the time in to learn each one? And it's mm. you kind of if there's a there is a factor that if you've invested in something, you're a bit more literally invested emotionally and financially. You either get something great from it or you you're wasted your money. So it forces you to work a little bit harder. No, I, I think that's true. I mean, and I can speak from the experience of someone who does from time to time get free gear you know um i always find that the stuff i bought myself is the stuff that i spend most time with because i've gone through a whole process to obtain that product you know yeah. i've gone through the purchase anxiety i've gone through the uh watching endless reviews and trying to work out bits and pieces and and so the emotional investment i've put into that to acquiring that piece of equipment you know is is something that then is rewarded in the use of it and you don't get if somebody just gives you something it's like oh that's great but it it, it lacks value to you personally you know it may mm. be great and you may use it i'm not saying that this is a hard and fast rule i'm just saying generally speaking it's the stuff that i've purchased that i will spend much more time with yeah same <laughs> um but in fairness, I did get I got uh, my V collection free, and I've actually used that a lot. So I have to say, yeah, yeah. I say it's only a generalization. <laughs> oh no, totally. It is sort of. It's like um, I tend to find there's a, like a path of least resistance. I'm yeah. I think isn't it? I'm sure someone uh, there's someone's quote where it's like all musicians are fundamentally lazy. <laughs> I was Colin Newman actually. Um, he's like you know we're all looking for a kind of for a kind of a quick fix, mainly just because we want to. To get ideas, you know, as soon as you can think of something, you just want to have it out there, and it's that it's a tricky one. Um, but yeah, no, I've I definitely the things that have cost me the most amount of money, I've had no choice but to but to spend the time with. But then, actually, in a weird example, that that Juno sixty is my sort of one of the most greatest things that ever happened to me. It was mm. a very strange story, but basically, someone on an internet forum gave that synth to me. Um, and so I'd never met. Um, this wow. was many, many, like decades ago. Well, it's not many. I can't remember how long I have had this thing. But yeah, I, I was posting about another synth, and this person was like, "Oh, you know, if you, if you want, um, my parents' place is in Dorset. Um, I don't live there anymore. Um, I've moved out of the country. If you want to make the trip to Dorset, you can have it." Uh, actually, he was talking about the JX10, which is the Roland like. Roland's sort of last, I see the last analog synth that Roland made for him. And then uh, time passed and then more analog synths got made. But, um, and then he said, oh, so there's a Juno 60. You can have that as well. Um, and I was like, whoa, like, <laughs> okay, what? I can have it? And it's like, it's those stories that you see, that you see people like, oh, found in a dumpster, like, you know, yeah. an Art 600 or something. Uh, but it kind of really was one of those. And I, have to admit i did think you know if i go to this house that i'm going to go into the house and the door's going to shut behind me and it's just going to be a dungeon and it's going to be like yep this is where we <laughs> capture synth nerds and talk to them <laughs> um, but guess what i we, we went me and uh, brian from archeria we went we drove to the person's house in dorset and this lovely really kindly old retired couple came out um and we're like, we've got the the organs ready for you to come out. Oh. This, and the organs, literally. Yeah. And then I remember the Juno 60 being passed down to me from the attic. This man's in his 80s. I was like, please let me go up there. Please don't fall down a ladder on my account. And then, yeah, JX10, Juno 60. And so technically, I got those instruments for free. But that Juno 60 has been with me and will never be... I will never be parted from it because mm. it's simple and it's sort of returning to that point is that the simpler the tool, I think, I don't know, I've got a sort of theory that the simpler the tool is, the more, you, it, the easier it is to get results 
you know, LA2A, I've said before, is like the greatest compressor because there's only two knobs. And it's, mm. I just think the, yeah, simpler is better in many ways. And if you compare, that certainly can be an issue with software since where there's too many controls, you know. Yes. Um, it's nice to have where it takes a lot more work on behalf of the designer to pare things down and, and reduce the amount of controls that you have available to the user because you have to, there's an insane level of work required to make all of those ranges meaningful and work together. You know, people who design reverb algorithms, reverbs are, I discovered, I've talked to uh, Sean from Valhalla DSP, um, which is a great, you know, great company. Mm -hmm. Talked to him about reverb design and, they are complex beasts. Like there is a lot happening in a reverb algorithm. If you could, you're saying if you could see it as a modular patch, it would be like your whole modular was filled. And you know the parameters that reverb designers give you to mess with is is a really tricky one. Um, mm. And uh, and so paring it down is hard. And maybe that's why you know not always it's, it's not always the case. And you know. It, there's this whole thing that if you're designing instruments, you know, I speak to a lot of people who design instruments, you know, for, for Archeria and, and other companies. And it's, you know, it's a real challenge to design an instrument that's just simple enough and appealing enough. And that, that but you can um, want people to look at it and say, well, there's lots I can do with that. But you don't want people to look at it and go, that's overwhelming. And it's, mm. that is really really hard line to sort of tread and it's an interesting one because in the case of you know soft synths and, and you know virtual environments things like reactor and max msp you know we can build our own synths and so you start to you, know, you can dabble in those decisions too same as even when you're using mm. ableton live and you use the little um eight knob um instrument rack you know and and in that sense you can become a designer because you can give yourself eight macro knobs to edit and it's it's a challenge if you've ever done that to kind of get it so that it does musically meaningful things it's not easy mm. i'm not sure where we're going but it's it's hard uh, i mean one of the things that i like about the spitfire uh, labs range of stuff you know they've released these these free libraries spitfire create massive mm. orchestral libraries of extraordinary uh, quality and then they somehow managed to fudge them all the way through some kind of synth engine to make them crazy which mm. i i like that also but they've released a, a bunch of uh, free libraries which come in a very simple interface which runs in contact i think and contact often software synths are running contact so sample based romplers i suppose are running contact all follow the same path on complexity it's it's one of those weird things where once you've learned how to use one of them you can probably use all the different synths that people produce for it because they all have the same modulation engines and effects engines and other things inside but they tend to be slightly overwhelming all this stuff i can do with these samples whereas the spitfire stuff it gives you one knob one mm. knob, so I've got some strange bunch of cellos. Sounds really nice. And it goes, oh, that's even nicer. And then, oh, okay, that's slightly different. But that's enough. You just load it yeah. up and you use it. It's it's kind of like a bit like the equivalent of having a Rhodes piano. You know, the Rhodes piano, it sounds like a Rhodes piano and you've got a couple of knobs and that's all I need it for. And I'm having a lovely time. Thanks very much. Um, and there's something about that stripped down... Uh, take away the control and just let you play and enjoy something. You can just go a little bit more and a little bit less, you know, and that that's enough. I think there's there's a lot in that, and we do overcomplicate things in software. Yeah, but it's that thing of when you look at something, it's got lots of controls. Does does it make it more appealing to a customer? Because you think, oh, there's lots I can do with it. I would just argue it's like you're paying. Because although those some of those labs things are free, you know, but they do have this. They've got these new like artist bundles that are coming out. Like yeah. I know Dark Star did one, um, and Afro Deutsch's done one as well. And there's, you know, these are sort of, and they have simple controls too. And I would argue what you're paying for is that they've made that decision for you. You know, I prefer yes. the, an, an analogy is when I go to like when we used to go to Nam. You know, you go to America and there's sort of there's like these burger places where They've got you all the options, all right? You can have mayo and ketchup and, you know, you go to Five Guys, they have this. And it's like, you know, you've got all types of onions, gherkins, pickles. Do you want cheese? Do you want this? 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 And it's like, I, I'm coming here because you're the burger chefs. I want you to tell me which creation is the one I'm going to like. Do you know what I mean? I, I, want, I want to go to a burger place 
where there's some options but they've been thought out by a burger professional and I can just, I'm, I'm up for trying what you recommend in that sense. So it's, mm, I personally, mm. I hate those burger places where I have to pick <laughs> because I'm like, I don't know what I want. There's too many options. Yeah. Curation is an interesting angle. Actually, somebody in the chat said that is the queen of pentacles. Is that a, the equivalent of a rompler, which is an, an interesting question. I haven't thought of it like that. that. I mean, but, I, I I purchased a Queen of Pentacles for because I wanted drums and I was sorry. What is it? It's it's from Endorphins. um, Oh, yes. yes. And it's essentially a seven channel drum module for Eurorack. Um, It's got uh, three channels of analog and four channels of sample based. I think I might have that right. Uh, It's very much like the. Yes, it's like the it's like the Black Noir, but it's like a, a different angle to it. Uh, and okay. I bought it precisely because I could not be asked to <laughs> to work out how to do percussion. I tried, I thought about it, and I was thinking, I've got to buy five modules, six modules in order to, you know, mm-hmm. I've got this huge module just to do a bass kick drum when I just want a kick drum, you know. And yeah, that seemed to perfect. that seemed to solve that that problem nicely. So yes, it is in in as much as I've I'm trusting endorphins to have produced a drum module that's got decent drum sounds in it that i can tweak a little bit you know and that's and that's okay i'm okay with that i don't have to design everything from the ground up myself i think yeah and it is usually i mean designing drum sounds is expensive in both senses for those terms like it's Mm. it takes a lot of modules to make sounds it's interesting if you get into the whole that's one of the things i was going to mention was the sort of um yeah, drum sounds and also the fact that you know old analog synths that have kind of quirks and sort of strange um like you know habits is the wrong term but it's true like analog synths that are old are all a little bit broken mm-hmm. and they are all they're all going to break in slightly different ways and actually i mentioned drum machines because i spoke to the um jeff from system 80 and asked about 808 modules and it's like you know everyone says all 808s are different. So if you're using like a software 808, hey, it doesn't sound like the real 808 or, you know, some people who say like, oh, X, you know, you know, virtual 808 drum machine, you know, DSP 808 drum machine doesn't sound like an actual 808. Well, they do all sound different. And it's it's because there's, you know, all of the capacitors and things have, have dried out slightly. And apparently it's, they are really sensitive. Drum, uh, I didn't appreciate this, but after I spoke to him, I did, that drum circuits are very sensitive and have to be tuned. And if you, if they've gone out of tune a little bit, it changes the pitch of the sound and they really do all sound different. Um, and that there's, I guess that's the thing that it seems so very charming when you, th- if you've just got computers and you're like, oh, that's cool, isn't it? There's so much latent personality in this thing because it's so variable and i just want some of that and i would kind of i while i would agree it also means that if you were buying like a real 808 you would have to take a chance that 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 808 which you would be Mm. paying a a premium for to get could be one that hasn't aged in a way that makes it sound good it might sound a little bit less exciting than you might think and it's just sort of there's trade-offs like for example you know, simple, silly things like my MKS7, which I've got, which I think is an amazing piece of kit. One of the outputs just isn't making sound at the moment. It's like, mm. I think it's wonderful to have hardware since I'm a DX7. One of the outputs doesn't make sound. You, so you only get stuff out the left. And it's like, that's not cool. That's not charming. That's just annoying. Um, and if I try to make music, my mixer, for example, a lot of the channels on this mixer, when I center the knobs, isn't in the dead center um and that's not charming either that's the when your kick drum you discover is slightly to the like one side in your final like mixer jam like that's not cool that's not a good that's not charming and so analog ain't all it's cracked up to be at least vintage oh. well people don't don't necessarily appreciate that as well i mean i'm talking to probably newer generations of people who have grown up with computer-based studios and computer-based software who are now being encouraged to go hardware because hardware is so cool we know that but it's also troublesome it's going to give you pains in the neck if you're you're going to then try to sync things up and you'll discover new worlds of hurt on on synchronization and timing and 
how come that doesn't actually sound it's not in tune with with reactor on my computer you know and mm. there's a lot that you're going to have to let go of when moving from software to hardware you know you're going to have to embrace this idea of drift and timings and um real life <laughs> yeah. somehow gets in the way once you're outside I remember back in my day when I was a lad, oh, right. we used to have to work out delay times with a special calculator <laughs> to tell me how many beats it was in milliseconds. Kids yeah. these days don't have to do that. It just auto sync. Like, yeah, when you're using hardware delays, they don't just magically auto sync to the tempo. You have to work, you know, MIDI sync them or work out the milliseconds or just do it by ear. And it's tap, it, well, it tap, sounds tap like, or tap tempo and it. It can be charming. It can be very uncharming. And I do like mm. just being able to like drag a plug in and just everything's perfect and gorgeous and consistent. And I can yes. fire it up and it's exactly where I left it. Um, whereas analog drifts and. Which well, this, is, this is where I drop in my, my guy called Gerald uh, anecdote, which is uh, he did. Um, he was part of Synthfest last year. Now he did a seminar. I was supposed, supposed to do a seminar. I did a seminar earlier in the day and Sound Sound asked me to sort of interview him in the evening, which didn't <laughs> didn't quite work out like that. Um, really? But he was, he turned up with all his gear very late because he hadn't been told or something. Doesn't really matter. But we're throwing all this stuff together. And essentially he ran his set. I mean, people don't know he was part of 808 State. He kind of was part of the beginning of, of electronic music and dance music of that genre and he's been doing it ever since and he was always a rolling person and but when he turned up with his gear he turned up with two laptops two crappy pc laptops you know no max or anything like that both of them running reason and he had uh, a tr8 uh, i think a couple of boutique uh, rolling bits of gear and he turned it all on and what he did there was no sync there's no cables going between anything he would just uh turn on a patch in reason on one laptop have that running he would browse for another patch on his other laptop set that running and he would just adjust the tempo until they were more or less right mm. and he would do that on the fly he would then find another patch which wasn't in time and start that up and then he would slowly tweak them together until they till they hung so he's using an incredibly digital system but he was running it in an analog way you yeah know? There was no no sync, no perfection, but it was banging. It was just, you know, absolutely on point because <laughs> he knew exactly what he was doing, you know. Yeah, yeah, like that. Where it's, it's, I think it's people who've DJed a lot as well, where there's kind of this sets of skills that you can bring to a party that, that mm. people who haven't can't. That was a question I asked your know, surgeon brought up was the fact that the fact that I've been DJing since like the early 90s makes a huge difference when it comes to doing improvised dance music on a modular let me tell you because mm. you know what a crowd responds to he's like there is always a part of my brain that's thinking about the modular but there's also a part of my brain that knows what a crowd wants and what a crowd is appealed you know is looking for at that particular moment and responding to their needs so that that's something that's hard one i mean a guy called Jared will have it um but yeah i'm not sure i do <laughs> <laughs> no, a braver man than me, that's for sure. I should probably say that if you have any burning questions you'd like to ask us, throw them into the chat because time is marching on and we should probably be thinking about bringing this to a to a sensible close at some sure. point. We decided whether we're going to like delete our computers or burn our <laughs> sense yet. But a, a question I wanted to ask you, Alex, was when you walk into your studio, what do you put your hands on to play with? <laughs> I'm sorry, can't believe you're asking that question. It, it is before the watershed. I just like it is. Out. Yeah, no, I don't, I, you don't mean anything dodgy with that. <laughs> but yeah, it's a good question. Um, mm, mm. I like. I mean, I don't do enough just like exploratory, like messing with the modular, and I should do more of that. And currently, my I've got like. I have multiple modulars and they're all sort of in most of them are in states of disarray i've got like a little like palette case that i've been doing videos with um and i'm really enjoying that because that is a process of building systems that are designed like building instruments so it's it's i found it really whenever i've been the most productive with modular and i've enjoyed it the most is where i've had a specific 
intent. Like, so I've said, I'm going to sit down to make an like acid jam today. And so if you have that goal in mind, you patch up some drums, you patch up a drum sequence, you patch up an acid line and you have a party. It's like, that's, that's a goal. And so mm -hmm. like doing little modules that modulars that are built for like, I'm going to do one that's like, uh, I did build a little one for doing uh, like a little modular for messing with a semi-modular as like a sidecar for it. And that's an interesting design objective. Like, you know, if you've got like a, you know, a mini brew or, or some, something that's semi-modular, what would you add to it? And you can start mm. to think about, well, okay, I want a digital oscillator and this and that. And, and having those goals has meant I've built a few of these and those are fun to mess with. But really it's the, the big one is that my, performance modular which is the thing in the sort of briefcase again over here yeah um this thing that thing there <laughs> which um, because that is just it, it's built for a purpose it's built to do certain things and i'm constantly tinkering with it but i can tell you it is it is the most fun modular mm. you know it's just it's built to make music it does bass drums some weird freaky noises and it's got it's got a bit of everything that you need. So if you stick on a pair of headphones, you can just lose yourself and just jam on on that. And then I just enjoy, I often like just one single thing, like just messing with one single synth and playing around, you know, um, that is a hugely edifying process. And it's in the case of synths that aren't exclusively analog in the sense that they've got presets, then that can be a really good way of working with them because you can, you can compartmentalize the process of sound design and writing and you can just sit with your synth and say this afternoon i am just going to make presets and make like 15 presets for your mm. thing and then the next day you can write a track with them or try to um, i think that's i find that useful because i'm i like to focus in on things like i say i like to try and use one thing at once and actually weirdly i've been trying to teach myself the the circle on which is this sequencer and it's it's very hard oh, right. to i say it's, very, it's not very hard to use but it's the circle on is very idiosyncratic it's been designed in a particular way it's had lots of other ideas like brought into it so it's it's bloated it's just got shortcuts for his workflow things that people have asked the guy to make and he's put them all in but that means that you have to learn them all. Uh, so it takes some getting used to, but weirdly what I've been doing is sequencing my software from it. Uh, so I've got like an Ableton Live thing with lots of instances of Diva and lots of instances of Analog Lab, like all working together and actually making all the sounds. Um, partly inspired by Square Pusher, who Square Pusher uses a hardware sequencer, but all his sounds come off the computer, but it's not, it's just the computer as a sound module. Mm. So well, actually, I have to say that yeah. software sequences, or you know, which is essentially a pan piano roll, is kind of where you get to with MIDI in indoors. It's the least inspirational place I think ever. You know, moving to hardware sequences, it's like, oh my god, I could do all this stuff. Look, look, tunes are coming out, and I haven't been clicking, and I haven't been playing chords and trying to work something out i've just been playing with voltage levels and it's creating these these tunes so yeah i totally feel that mm. the and i'm now suddenly going right right the, yeah the sq64 that i i recently reviewed i need to plug that into my computer and do some, do yeah. some stuff that way because that's that's what it's asking for i think it's and that's yeah. the good thing about those things is the these hardware sequences that have been coming out do not have to be used you know whenever i make videos about them i'm always using it with hardware Yes, but all of it applies to software, and so you know, for what is relatively low cost, you can have this kind of hybrid experience where you've got all of the sound power of the computer, but you've got the physical immediacy yes. of a hard device to sequence. And it's it isn't better or worse, but I know what you're saying about the piano roll, where it's like it's the piano roll lends itself to certain types of things, and it's it can be habit forming. I find you know, mm. there's things I do with a piano roll. Um, so you know you it's it's good that you can get these things very inexpensively so you can get like you know the key step or the 37 i've got the key step 37 this is like the sort of previous one uh where i had a, a sort of developer unit but basically it, i mean that is amazing you can there is stuff that i would come up with on that that i would not come up with on a piano roll do you know what i mean and so yeah 
it's um yeah well, it's that, good. that annoyingly good um uh arpeggiator no no it's not the strum it's the there's an arpeggiator the pattern uh, arpeggiator that just creates a better bass line than i did every time oh. what's that what like an app or something no 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 on the key step it's on the, the last thing on the knob where's mine all, all the, the way around thing. on the arpeggiator mode you know, you've That's got your up and down, and you've got your randomization, and then you've got pattern mode, which is an arpeggiator pattern. It just creates a, an I interesting never, thing. Hardly ever Have you the... not? Well, don't, no, because you, you'll Sorry, ruin. Your trick. Yeah, no, it will ruin your uh, bass lines because you'll be going, oh, I've been working on this bass line, it's brilliant. And then you'll go, I'll just try that out. Oh, that's so much better. <laughs> oh, it's a bit like, um, yeah, different. Instead of it being like as played, which is order, yeah. it's like different patterns. It comes it... up with a, it, whatever notes you're holding, it comes up with a pattern to play those notes and it's different every time uh yeah i think it is and it's just great <laughs> they've got walk as well which is the um like brownian motion where it's like a bit forward but not like you get that on the metropolis which is a fun one yeah um, it's a mess I, yeah i hardly i'm so obsessed with the sequencer mode on these things that i hardly mess with the the arpeggiator and I, um yeah you've highlighted my and that's that's the well, thing is it's like it's it's this that's the limiting factor like i need to you know and it's good to be experimental and and just go a bit mad and try different things i need to do more of that because mm. um it's those it's through happy accidents that cool stuff happens it's um equally possible with software and hardware um but again it's the chef it's the chef mm. that makes the difference not at all so well someone in the chat asked me what my orange case is which is just over there to my on my shoulder and actually, this is slightly inspired by you, I have to say, with your techno case. As in, I, I started getting overwhelmed with modules because <laughs> I was getting a lot of kits, doing a lot of DIY that suddenly, because at the end of you, one had great fun make, building this thing. Then it's like, oh, I've got another module. Like, oh, I've got another module. And anyway, that right. sort of thing right. continues. Right. Yeah. And then people send you stuff and then you buy things and suddenly you're filled up and you're overfilling and you've got drawers full of stuff. It's just, it's yeah. just drives Sounds you nuts. Familiar. Yeah. yeah. And it's like, what am I doing? I, I got a bit, uh, sort of lost my head over it a little bit. So I thought I'd get myself a smaller case and make it the thing that I use. I make music on, you know, a couple of oscillators, filter, all the, just the basic bits, nothing crazy. And mm. then perhaps alongside that, I'd have a, a thing with the weirder stuff that I tried to plumb into it. But just to have something which has my favorite bits in for now. And so, as I say, following your lead on the on the way you you built your techno case together, that that was kind of the idea. And it's in the right way. way. Yeah, no. and it's called. It was by a company called Case from Lake, who I think are in Italy. It was. I just I was googling, came across it on Reverb, liked what they were doing, asked, could you do this? And they said, sure. So uh, so there it is. Um, that is good. With a purpose. Nice. Yeah, Actually, with a purpose. With... It's got a lid. I can take it off somewhere. So, uh, I'm I'm currently at half. I mean, this isn't even half done, but the, I'm trying to um, build a, another live system that's based on like being inspired by talking to surgeon and doing. I want to do a live system for just murder techno, you know, like an, <laughs> an, an like an angry version. Of my, I mean, a lot of the time, my other modular makes like things in the Dorian scale and it's very kind of funky and sort of upbeat. I want something that is like unashamedly annoyed with you at yes. all times. I was messing with uh, this thing, uh, which is the uh, Quadranted Swarm from another uh, French company, EO Wave. EO Wave, yeah. I very, very much recommend that. If you want to mess around with, like, goodness gracious, gravy and whiskers, this thing is fun. Um, and it's very good for techno. Um, so I was going to basically, and that actually, although it's a standalone device, um, it comes out of the case. Um, Ooh. So it's a module um, so I'm going to stick it in the case and build something around but again for that purpose it's for the I've enjoyed messing with that device and another thing I am going to distill what I enjoyed about that device into its own little performance system built around mm. it you know with that and some other you know carefully chosen bits and bobs and that's a design goal you know it's and that's what's important is just is to have an objective yeah. be clear what it is you're trying to do and 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 then it's not you're not just getting things for its own sake you really know why you've made these decisions and you're getting the most from them you hope it's um mm -hmm. that's obvious it's just easy to lose sight because there's so many exciting things you know it's i'm partly 
you know, all of us are responsible for, you know, it's my, I mean, my job to say what's exciting about some new thing and tell you about some new exciting toy. And um, it's all, you know, you just get it, but but use it, but use it, make mm. some stuff. And um, yeah. knowing what you, what your objectives are is it's it's just easy to lose sight of it. But just yeah. just make sure you make time for play and not just for going on forums or buying <laughs> stuff all the time. <laughs> I mean, I would recommend performing if you if you can, if you can find a way to, you know, to persuade yourself to do it, because there's a lot of sort of open mic electronic nights in places mm. in, in cities around the place, you know, just give a shout out to, uh, you know, open electronic mic nights, whatever you call them, go along, you know, um, mm. take something and make some noises with it for 10 minutes. People would love it. Not, maybe depending on your tier, but you can stream yeah. is the things we're doing now. It's like, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's oh, one yeah. thing is that you can That's sort of thing. yeah that whole COVID-19 thing but, oh, but streaming is is you know I, I've it's been hugely valuable to me as well for just mm. being able to say like because you do need a bit of a kick up the bum it needs to be a sort of it, there has to be a bit of a like basically every time I've made big changes to my modder it's because someone said I want you to come and play I go right well I better I've now got yes. a deadline to think about yeah. this let's just squeeze this in and try and sort it out and i'll make the changes that i need and yeah you, i agree with you i think that's a good shout it's just mm. setting it's almost like the you know it's the classic thing of if you're trying to finish an album but you're not a signed artist you don't have a deal and so there's no one shouting at you to say hey where's the album robin like but if you you know set a deadline and what I mean, the sort of evil trick that I've had before, which I've mentioned, is is bet your friend money uh, that if you don't make the deadline, you'll have to give them the money or <laughs> you know, give, it, give it away to an organisation you don't agree with or something. You know, and it needs to be quite a lot of money. It needs to be like some an amount that you really do not cannot afford to lose, and and that is the sort of it has to be an evil force that stop it can't be something good it can't be something good happens if you don't do it because then you'll be like oh well at least that nice thing happened i made mm -hmm. my deadline so um set yourself a task but as you say like if you were to book a you know set up a stream and play I mean, it depends yeah. if you but, but there's, there's a lot of online kind of really good online communities and modular and yeah, doing... I mean, it, it doesn't have to be i mean talking about streaming you don't have to to feel sort of sad and lonely streaming only to your you know, 20 facebook friends or whatever there are i mean i'm just thinking now of, of the virtual open mic at nights that i'm trying to find a link for yeah, and so yeah. i was on one a vemom they call them virtual electronic music open mic go and check that out v-e-m-o-m -M. and um it's it's just a it's like a twitch based radio station you can submit a video or you can do it live and they'll they'll have you on for up to 10 minutes Mm. And you can be there and you can watch it and everyone's in the chat going, oh, wow, that's really great. Uh, because we will try to be positive, you know, <laughs> and there's all sorts of people uh, on it. And it's an opportunity to to force yourself out there because ultimately, I mean, what are we making music for? I mean, for our soul, I suppose, of course, but also to be heard and to express ourselves and to somehow push, push into the world. And we have extraordinary ways of doing that now, virtually in in streaming. And so don't don't be afraid, don't be shy. And it does give you that sense that I must get a track ready for tonight. And so I'm going to flip and <laughs> get something working. I've got to you know. finalise it. Yeah, and ten minutes is a pretty. That's a good, easy amount of time. You know, it's sort of low in the kind of. It shouldn't be too hard to do. Mm. And and yet you could feel very rewarded for, for it going well you know i think the one thing to bear in mind is you'll always um no matter who i talk to and then, and again it's like talking to a surgeon like a person who has performed for many 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 decades and is like at the top of his game but he's like oh i, I talked about a gig that i saw him play at and i thought it was great it was one of the coolest things i've ever seen he was like yeah that went all totally wrong that was a bit of a disaster that night and i'm like <laughs> glad that People at your level, people still say that, and is so. The important point is, even if you don't think it went well, is what other people perceive of the music is is kind of nothing to do with you, if that makes any sense. None of your business is. Yeah. So you just have to just understand that people will appreciate and take what they want from it, and don't worry about it. Just do it. Yeah, and they don't necessarily know how it was supposed to go. 
exactly it's, it's only you going i don't know yeah. i'm pressing i mean i remember one of my first uh, open mic nights at in norwich and like i say it, the table was too low i'm using euro rack so it's small um i'd had a beer all the lights were off all i could see was the glowing mouton that i've got all those mute um lights staring at me and then I, my brain switched and i couldn't remember which was on which was off is it moot when it lights on is it moot when it's lights off i don't know i don't know and i'm just hitting things trying to find the filter and i don't know what happened but you know people nodded and applauded politely at the end <laughs> That's, and then oh, i felt look, like I, i'd achieved oh. something <laughs> But uh, <laughs> yeah, so uh, well, Where I mean, there, there were no burning questions, particularly that came up in the in the in the chat, unless I've just missed them all and ignoring them, which is which is also possible. Let me just have another scan, because um, time is is running sadly. Uh, no, <laughs> they're all happy. Everyone's left. Right. Yeah. This yeah. Is debated da, da. no i think everyone's good if i've missed your question i'm really sorry we'll, we'll pass it on in the uh in the replay or something i don't know anyway uh i mean that's been fascinating i don't know whether we we debated what we were supposed to debate i don't think yeah, that's important i think we talked about synths and stuff uh software and hardware we did yeah we did that uh, that was we great did. Yeah, that was a lovely way to spend an afternoon. I'm going to play some applause now. <laughs> oh, no. Stop. Oh. Wait. Too much. <laughs> that's it. Oh. I'm not having you on again. That's, that's it. I'm so sorry. Uh, wait. <laughs> I'm having fun. Are you having fun? <laughs> wait, where's he? No. No. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> uh, so uh, ZBS asks the do you have any thoughts on Expert Sleepers ES9 for hardware software integration? I mean, do check out the live stream I did last night, which was all about that. We did speak about the Expert Sleeper stuff, although I don't have one, but I did speak about it and other ways of connecting. Do you do any of that sort of DC coupled stuff? I, no, I don't. I don't really. I've got the Expert Sleepers uh, ES3 and 4, which are the older ones. I, well, I particularly use them as, um, especially as an input module, like having as an ADA expander, like I think that's just the most useful thing ever because then, you know, that means that you can easily feed your modular into the computer mm. yeah. um, and sort of record from it and record your jams, like stems of your jams. The other thing you could do is if you have like the ES with the, you're using it as an input module is then you could be using like a MIDI controller as like a mixer. So you could use your computer as a mixer so you could get much more control over the sort of final arrangement of jams. Do you know what I mean? Instead of committing a, a two track down and that's fine as well, because by committing a two track down, you've committed and you've actually mm. made some decisions and it's for better or worse, it's done. And there's uh, so much to say about that workflow, but you could, I like this idea of using kind of a MIDI controller to do the dubby jamming and the, the muting and the fading in and out and then just recording all of the raw audio anyway, and that gives you total flexibility. I mean, that might be a way you want to work. I'd be tempted on balance to say I'd prefer to work in the destructive way because um, for me, I just, I need to try and reduce decisions yes. and make, do you know what I mean? Like, I don't, I'm not disciplined enough to sort of fully appreciate that flexibility. And so, but it is an option. And it, if you were, depending on what you were trying to do, if you needed some recall, and if you'd made mistakes and, you know, you were half 99% of the way there, then it could just get you 100% because you could fix the, you know, mutes and rides. So, um, but it is, yeah, it's really good. And for a lot of people as well, if you're just starting out, then that can also mean that, that your computer can do lots of functions like be a sequencer and BLFOs. It also means that you can use like Max MSP to control your modular and there's like loads to be done. Mm. Um, you know, I think you'd find like as time moves on, you, a lot of the time you want to do things just in hardware. If you've got hardware, you want to get more LFOs because you want to be hands on, but you don't have to be. Um, so it just depends if you're, it depends on your goals. If you're, it does, yeah. I mean, uh, MIDI to CV is, is another, is a simpler option. 
perhaps. Uh, there's there's yeah. great discussions to be had on MIDI and CV, the differences and how one is better or not than the other. But often, I mean, certainly if you're starting out, you're not going to notice the difference between using a MIDI to CV converter and DC coupled CV coming directly out of your computer, I think. So it, it may just be a simpler way to go to be able to use all your normal door tools and you're just stuffing it out into a module which converts that into control voltage. You know, that's, yeah. a, that's an easier step, I think. Um, I mean, there's a lot of creative things. Like you could also use the expert sleeper stuff to create your oscillator sounds and just use analog filters. I mean, that's not something we didn't really talk about in this deb in our debate, but filters are a particular quirky one there are really 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 good analog model filters now um but yeah in some filter designs they are very like non-linear and they are quirky and they that is can or can be hard to model um just it's just complex problems for for dsp engineers to surmount but we've got really good clones but you know, uh, for like drive and distortion and for certain like really like bonkers filters, then that's a world where I like having modules because there are some modules that I've got that really do just sound mm. screaming and howling in a way that I've, there are other screamy howly things in the software world that are very screamy howly, but that there's a particular screamy howl that the, that module does that doesn't exist elsewhere. Like for example, the, um, I'm showing off here, but I've got the ALM Fizzle Guts, which is the FZ1, uh, Casio FZ1 filter in a Eurat module, and there ain't no plug-in of that, and the only way that you can get it is you need the actual chip. So, um, I've got it. Oh also, two, two knobs. Two, two knobs. With it, so. Yeah, two knobs yeah, as yeah. opposed to your mouse. Trying to trying to do the the whole two knobs thing on a mouse is not going to work. Mm. You know, back to that interface idea again. It's true. Um, oh okay it's getting too late for questions now sorry <laughs> because the reason being is i have to get my my daughter onto a zoom for her brownies group you know real life is going to start coming back again mm, yeah, shortly. Yeah, so um so yeah i think i think sadly we'll have to bring this bring this to a, a close but um yeah. feel free to send in more questions in the comments and the video and that kind of thing and uh, we'll see if we can get to those too so uh thank you so much alex for spending this time with me it's been it's been totally brilliant and thank, uh, you. thank you everyone in the in the chat to who has contributed to this and who has watched it's uh, very kind of you to spend some time and uh happy thanksgiving i suppose we should say to our american friends god bless you yep. and uh, just to note it's that <laughs> just, just to note that to uh tomorrow is the the last of the computer music week things that we are doing a live stream of tweaking windows which should be fun. I think I've worked it all out. It's going to be brilliant. So if you need help with that or want to discuss that or you want me to dispel all the usual tweaking myths, then uh, come along and we'll check that out tomorrow night at 8 o'clock. And then on Sunday, I've got my regular uh, Molten Music chat for the Molten Music Monthly on the Sunday to talk about all the news and the last things that get drunk. And I might even perhaps give you a little preview of an exclusive range of modules that I might know something about. Mm. I might not, mm. I don't know, I haven't decided yet so anyway, I think we should leave that there thank you ever so much for being here and um, and we'll, we'll toddle off I'll find the end stream button yay that's lovely see, see you again bye <laughs>